Well, it's good to be here again. And I don't know how many times this is that we've been doing the uh, talks on archaeology, but I decided to continue that since so many people enjoyed it. But I do have some things I'll be changing. Robbie's going to be gone for what, four or five times that I'm here. Oh, I'm sorry, Pastor Dean. I'm sorry, Robbie was my student. That's all of it. Okay, uh, Pastor Dean, Pastor Student. Um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> And so it, it's always a benefit that I have that when I have a student and I can say, you know, all of what you're saying, I probably taught you. No. <laughs> of course, that's not true. But hopefully you have people that gain the skill of, uh, and, and uh, an interest of study through what you offer them. So, uh, and I hope I'm doing that for you because the study on archaeology is fascinating. The study of old things. And that's essentially what the word archaeology means, ancient, ancient things. Uh, lagos is used with everything, by, you know, that you can imagine. It means study of uh, for our purposes. And so we're going to talk about archaeology tonight, but I am going to drop in a couple things, possibly, at least one on Sunday, a little different story to tell you. It'll be a book sermon on a book. I'll not tell you which one right now. And it, uh, it's the first Bethlehem story. I'm going to see if you can figure that out. Uh, so uh, we'll, do a, we'll do a study on that on Sunday. But uh, right now we're going to talk about archaeology as it relates to the question of geography. Did anybody like geography in school? I thought geography was interesting. I liked history, geography, any of those kinds of things. Uh, where I failed was math. I mean, literally, failed was math. <laughs> So I'm not a mathematician, but I do enjoy uh, studying history and words. I love writing and, and those things and logic. And uh, I had my uh, math teacher in college one time. I didn't fail, but she, she told me, she said, you should be doing better in math since you do so well in Greek. So I took out my Greek New Testament and put it in front of her, and I said, would you please read this passage for me? I said, I have the same problem with math. <laughs> <laughs> and that was all that discussion. So anyway, she was a nice person. I could do that. But archaeology and geography, we're going to study the issue of several things. One was we're going to look at questions of broader geography in reference to the biblical text and archaeology. Uh, then we're going to look at some sites, and even we'll look at some more localized things along the way as we study it. So uh, let's just start off and move through this, the importance of text in context. I think I told you last time when we were studying archaeology and Jesus that I'm a little bit of a skeptic. Now, I don't mean I'm a rabid skeptic, but what I do mean is that just because a person says something doesn't to me mean it's true. I think it needs to be verified. I want to follow the science. I mean the real science. That is, you can really check it and test it. And the same thing with archaeology, which is a form of knowledge. Science merely means, that word sensi in Latin means knowledge. So that's what I want to follow, true knowledge and not merely speculations or something else. So even with the Bible, I know some people, well, if the Bible says it is true, and I think that is true, but I, nonetheless, I believe that if it is true, then it will have some telltale signs of being true. That's why I think I told you last time when I was uh, flying on a plane with a couple of very fine, a young couple, a Mormon couple going into missionary work in, a, in Fiji. Uh, he was doing his graduate work under a scientist that was working there. And uh, they asked me what I thought about the Book of Mormon. And I said, well, I, I, I have a problem because if I went to the land of Israel and I asked where about going to Jerusalem and the guy says, what's that? And I say, what about the Sea of Galilee? Let's, look at, let's go on the sea. He says, we don't have any seas here. If after a while I'd begin to think, we got a problem. Well, see, the Book of Mormon is no more than the Middle Earth and, and the Lord of the Rings. It doesn't exist. So just because a person says it or because it's written down is not enough. It has to have something that provides evidence. And I'm not alone, by the way. A man by the name of Luke did the same thing. He said, I have taken in hand to carefully examine 
all those things that have been purported among us. In other words, I just didn't write it down. I checked it out. I talked to eyewitnesses. I, I looked it up. In other words, I examined it. And so I don't think that's wrong. It's just that I think that it's like my students saying, you don't have to know everything to know something, right? You don't have to know everything, but you better know something to know something. And so that's what we're going to do. We've talked about history. We've talked about documents. Uh, we want to talk about geography and why is geography important in the Bible and in archaeology, okay? Christianity rests upon the affirmation that a series of events happened at specific locations. You know, if I found evidence that Jesus was crucified in Capernaum, I'd have some issues because the text is so plain that it happened in Jerusalem. I don't ever expect that to be the case, but I'm saying we've just got to know that when we read, there is intelligible, clear, logical, historically factual information. And you know what's so great about the Bible? Is that unlike any other ancient work of writing, and I mean without any example, the Bible is so supported it's almost unbelievable. We have 10,000 archaeological pieces of evidence that connect directly to things that are mentioned in the Bible. That doesn't happen elsewhere, let me assure you. <laughs> and the reason why is because it's true, but archaeology is not something I use apologetically. I don't want to, you know, I'm going to prove you and get you into the kingdom by believing in archaeology. Uh, I think something else is going to have to take place. But on the other hand, it may not be for conversion, but it certainly is for understanding and knowledge and growth. And so that's what we want to do is grow through this process gain more and more trust in what we read, be more understanding what is written. And that's what we find here. Uh, this also becomes important when we deal with the issue of translation of the Bible, which is an issue I'll talk about a little bit later when I talk about hills and mountains in the Bible. And I'll give you an example of that then. So the Bible rests upon these affirmations that these specific events occurred. This means that geography, history, and faith are inextricably bound together. Geography heightens the impact on our senses and emotions of the reality of these Bible events and, and places. You know what? Even still today, I've been to Israel. I'm, I'm beginning to lose track. Is it 40-something times? I've been so many times I live, I'm losing track. I guess I should have written it on the wall. But I've just gone again and again and again and even lived there some. It just, you know, it's... But even having done that, every time I go, my senses are aroused and my wonder is increased. I mean, just being there and experiencing that setting and all those things that run through my mind as I think about the biblical text, uh, when I experience that anew every time. It's not something I get bored with. There's a lot of places I could go once and I'd be happy. You know, but the Bible, I'm never satisfied. With the, with the biblical land, I've always got to go again. I hope someday that uh, you take the time to go. Uh, and I, I won't say too much about it since I know that a uh, competitor may be, be wanting to take people. But, but I go, and I, I go to Turkey, which is a phenomenal, one of the best places I've ever been, Asia Minor, and Greece, and Italy, and Egypt, and all these wonderful places to understand more about the Bible. Uh, it heightens the impact on our senses and the emotions that come with it. It provides rich and decorative illumination for Bible reading. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to do in my visual study Bible, here comes the advertisement, uh, is that I, I really think the value of what I'm trying to offer is that when you read the Bible, you can look and see as you're reading what is talked about in the text. And that's what we're working toward. Matter of fact, I had a missionary recently send me an e uh, email, and he said, he's with Wycliffe Bible Translators. He said, what you've done in the study Bible is something that we desperately need on the mission field. He said, because we will teach people a written language, translate the Bible into their language, and when they read it, they haven't got a clue what it's talking about because it's totally different from what they experience constantly. It's another world, like going to the moon. 
And so when they read now with a visual study Bible, what happens is that when they read the text, they can see what the text is saying as they go through. And it opens it up. Hopefully, people on foreign mission fields will not be translating, Behold the pig of God who takes away the sin of the world, which has been done repeatedly. Why? Because they, not a single person has ever seen a sheep. And the only animal they have of real worth in their midst is a pig. And the fact is, that's a problem for us theologically, for the pig to be a representation of Jesus. And yet, they don't know the difference. They don't understand the experience, and they haven't got a clue what a lamb is, what a sheep is, or any of these things. How many know what a coney is? Raise your hand. Very few, though, but a few of you do. Coney, part, part rabbit, part squirrel, you know. And I've got great pictures of conies. I even got a great one just looking at me like that. <laughs> and, uh, and so you get into the Bible by visual means uh, as well as the written text. Enhanced awareness of the nuances in the biblical context makes more accurate translation of the biblical text possible. And I think my example probably satisfies that issue right there. Uh, translating it correctly sometimes only comes with having a proper understanding of what you're talking about. Now, what I'm going to be saying, well, I'll go ahead and say one of these things now because I could keep on saying, well, I'll be talking about that. If the translators of the English Bible originally had left England or wherever they were and came to Israel, had traveled, and come to Israel, and stood at the shores of a place we call the Sea of Galilee, they would never have made that the translation. Why? Because it is a lake. Matter of fact, a medium-sized Texas lake. It is not a sea. Seas are quite different. But they translated Sea of Galilee because they knew it was a body of water that you had boats on, and the only thing that they visualized was a sea. But a sea and a lake are not the same thing. Now, the Greek has no problem. It's not that there's an error in the Bible. The word thalassa in Greek can mean lake or sea, according to what it is. See, it's not a problem. It's a body of water. And you'd know whether it was one or the other. But translators got it wrong because they did not really understand the, the, the way the land looked, the way it worked. Does that make sense to you? And so uh, we need to be able to get accurate translation. So we have introduction to physical geography. Uh, what we have here is science that describes the surface of the land and its associated phenomena, climates, peoples, animals, products. In other words, not merely the tangible earth, but those things that are connected to that tangible earth is what he's saying. It provides a rich and decorative backdrop heightens a sensory and emotional impact. I'm sure you will see that to be the case sometimes if you do some things. Uh, not too long ago, Irene and I, we were in Israel, and I, I should say pre-COVID because you can't get over there much now, but uh, we went to uh, one of the uh, lifts up to Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon's what you call a mountain. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But... Uh, it's, it's important that we have a proper backdrop for what we're looking at. And I tell you, it's pretty exciting when you think about when you see at the Caesarea Philippi and the waters actually come underneath Caesarea Philippi, cold waters going down into Tel Dan where you can drink it and it's, good, it's better than any water you can buy in the, in the grocery store, the, the purity of it going on down, all the way down to what we call the Sea of Galilee and floating and flowing through the Sea of Galilee, coming up on the other side, moving into what we call the Jordan River, eventually to be dumped into the Salt Sea, as it was called in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the Dead Sea. Well, see, isn't that exciting just to get that picture in your head that you understand the movement and how things are? And uh, just a little thing like that, it just opens up the text a little more. Uh, geography and history and religion are inextricably bound together. Uh, 
And you find out that oftentimes religion and geography have a lot to do with it. You may not understand, but even where the, the, the contest between Elijah, Eli, Yah, my God is Yahweh, Eli, Yah, and the prophets of Baal and Asherah on top of the mountain, the mountains in those days and the setting of that story were places that were watered by the gods, particularly the god Baal. And so even the mountain itself carried a religious significance in the Canaanite thought. And at that juncture, God revealed himself to be true God over against the false gods of the Canaanites. Okay, and, 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 all the, and, and so you have to understand it. In the middle of the drought, and all of a sudden God brings a burst, a, a cloud burst of water uh, in, in response to what had happened. So uh, we can get into the text and get excited about it, I hope. Um, Christianity rests upon the affirmation that a series of events that happened. Would you agree? If all these various events hadn't happened in Christianity, we wouldn't have a lot to talk about. Very important. And geography regarding to that. Well, in ancient cartography, you have Genesis 10, the table of nations. You're familiar with that? You have three guys by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Is that right? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I miss that? You have the three sons of Noah who went out and formed the nations that we think of today. One went east, one went west, one went south, that kind of thing. You know, they all spread out. And gradually we have what we have today. Moving to the east, and as time changes, genetically within I really believe this, by the way. In, in Adam and Eve, genetically, were all the potentialities of humanity. And gradually, as that separated into the sons of Noah, those potentialities begin to change and become the peoples that we are throughout the world. And so uh, the table of nations is geographically is important for the movement of, of humankind to spread throughout the world as we know it. And, of course, we know that the Indians didn't start in America. I know we say they're Native Americans, and that's fine with me. But actually, they, they traversed here probably from the area of the, uh, across the strait and uh, came more from the context of eastern, the eastern people, uh, and uh, Asians and so forth. Uh, so I, want, I don't want to try to get into the details here. Now, uh, and then look at this. What took place is over time, the earth has spread. And one thing you're going to find interestingly is that the context of the biblical people was not what we do. We usually think because we know there's a North Pole, South Pole. I don't think these people had any knowledge of a North and South Pole. They didn't understand the movement of the earth in the same way we do. They tended to look East and South and, and what we would call North and their North and South were to them the, what we would think of as east and west, and the opposite, the real east here is west here, because they focused toward that part of the world and that part of the world, moving into the Mediterranean or moving toward into to Babylonia and to even Asia. See, their whole concept of the world was different from ours and how they emphasized things. So understanding that helps us as we read the text sometimes. You understand? Because of the focus that they had. And here are some groups of people uh, one, one important one here, for example, the one Asher, you're familiar with that, which eventually brought in the peoples we think of uh, as people like Assyrians and so forth. Uh, Canaan, the Canaanites, uh, on down into Mizraim, which is the Egyptians. Uh, these different groups, uh, the terminology we see in the Bible, the idea of Magog and Gomer and all of these things, that's not really our language anymore, but they're people that existed in these areas. So that's sort of what we look at when we read the text. There are tribal city lists, believe it or not. These are very early. We find that, for example, that there are some early maps that were created. These have been found. They're not, they're not really fancy like the ones we have today, but they were the first attempt to explain uh, the uh, nomenclature, or not the nomenclature, but the geographical uh, uh, structure of the world. Uh, you have one at Nuzi in 2200 B.C. and others that you see right here. Uh, notice here uh, another uh, tribal city list that you find in Joshua. 
These were all available people, not to say that they did a lot of important, we have certain abilities to do more than they could do by our perspectives, you know, being able to look over the land and so forth. But they had a perspective of importance of geography and where things were. Uh, especially this becomes true when we talk about the Tigris and the Euphrates. Very important thing. It's a designation in the Bible for what? It's a place between which the Garden of Eden existed. If you go look in the, in the, in the text. And so that became an important feature of the ancient world, moving from that area, which we think of as Babylon. Today would be partly Iraq, Iran, places of Syria. Those areas, under different names, were, begin, were seen as sort of the beginning of the human race and our movement. And that becomes important, particularly as we start moving down into Canaan, down into Egypt. So your movements basically went, you know, Egypt up through Israel, up into the areas of what we think of as the uh, south uh, eastern Medi uh, Asia Minor, over you know, the areas of Assyria, Babylonia, and Persia. Those are the major places of significance in the development of the biblical materials. Um, Egypt had what they called cartouches. Are uh, you familiar with the term, or cartouche? And some of these were what they call name rings, where you actually had two components of the cartouche that actually were words that expressed things. If you go to my study Bible in Matthew chapter 1, you'll see I give you examples of this one we're looking at here in just a moment, right here, but shows you the name ring of the highlands of David, which is the king uh, that this is one of the three proofs of David's existence historically. And another one was found in the Tel Dan area. Another was found in what we think of as Jordan in the Moabite area. And But right here it was one. Now, if you'll notice at the bottom, uh, there are some blanks that have happened. And I was told when I was in Egypt, uh, uh, somebody, did, did anybody go on that tour with us in Egypt from here? You were on the tour? Okay, good. And who else? Somebody else? Uh, anyway, remember the guy said, and I didn't realize this, but that the actually just a few, a couple of decades before then, the Niles had risen to such a point that it loosened some of those things and they were washed away. Unf but fortunately, we had archaeologists prior to that time who had made all these, you know, drawings of all these places, and, and, and so we have evidence of, of what was there. But the Shishak city list there, these are the, and the city list of, of the uh, Pharaoh Shishak the first was, in fact, talking about his many exploits into what we think of as Israel. And so here's some more. 180 places in the Negev that he claims to have destroyed. And one of them said he also exploited the highlands of David, which is significant. Uh, in Assyria, you have a list of defeated cities. The kings and pharaohs and emperors and so forth of the ancient world did not hesitate whatsoever to uh, talk about their exploits. They were not particularly modest in the way they did things. They liked to record everything that happened positively uh, for them. You'll notice that anything negative that happens never seems to make it on the records. It's sort of like today when you have certain people pushing certain things. It's always one-sided, you know. And so, for example, when the king gets back, he doesn't mention, and this is one of the best ones, when the king, um, uh, was it Nebuchadnezzar? Uh, I, I, my mind's up here and I'm trying to think right now. But anyway, the, I think it was Nebuchadnezzar. Anyway, when he came into the southern kingdom with Hezekiah, I'm, 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 not, I, I'm a little foggy in my mind if that's accurate. But he comes in and his entire army largely gets wiped out in a night. I mean, he conquered... Lachish at the bottom, he had conquered several of the southern cities. He came against Hezekiah's Jerusalem where God chose to protect it after Hezekiah's, you know, request and so forth. And, and he's got this great army that largely gets wiped out in one night by an angel of God. Now, can you imagine being the king and getting up in the morning saying, well, we're going to take them on now, guys. Just blow that place away. 
and he looks around, everybody was on the ground dead. That would tend to knock the, you know, the air out of you a little bit, you know, as a king. And so he did what they called, you know, he basically uh, packed up his goods and went back where he, was, where he came from. And I'm trying to still think, of, I don't think that's the right king. But anyway, the point of it is, um, that was found, that whole victory of all the southern uh, kingdom, uh, all the southern uh, cities, and particularly Lachish, which was really big, second to Jerusalem, talked about all those things in great length. And just, he said, well, he said, I, I trapped up Hezekiah like a bird in a cage and then went back home, as though that was what he would do which is nonsense. You wouldn't leave your prize untouched. And so they tended to do that in their, in their uh, various records when you start looking through. Only their victories are mentioned. Sennacherib. What? Sennacherib. Sennacherib. Thank you. I, I knew I was saying wrong. I just could not get it in my head. Yes, yeah, Sennacherib. Thank you. And that was Assyrian. So, um, but here it gives you the perspective of the way in which the world was viewed toward the Mediterranean toward Asia, as we think of it, north and south, and a question of focus uh, in their development. Eusebius wrote a thing called the Onomastican, which I, by the way, have a copy of, which is cool. I uh, came across it, and um, it is his writing uh, of, the, uh, of the various places throughout the world that he was aware of. Uh, I know you may not know about uh, this man, uh, Eusebius was the, what was viewed as the uh, librarian of the large library in the 4th century that existed at Caesarea by the sea, Caesarea Maritima. And that was when, at that point, you know, Constantine had declared the church official, you know, uh, you could be a Christian and not be killed, and on and on. And so uh, Eusebius was a, a learned person, he, and he wrote all sorts of things that were helpful of church history, but one thing he did, he got interested in geography, and he, he wrote about a lot of the sites in the ancient biblical world that are found in the Bible. And his testimony at that juncture is very helpful. And we're going to see another thing in just a moment that was very helpful also. In the 6th century, we have the oldest map of the ancient world uh, found on the floor of a church. Has anybody been to Mataba? Mataba, okay, so you know what Mataba is. It's a Christian center, basically, uh, that exists between Petra and going to Amman, Jordan, on the way up on the Dead Sea. And uh, at Manaba, they have on the floor of a church a well-worn, but nonetheless it's still helpful, map of the ancient world. And so what we find here is that uh, we have Eusebius' work to help us and other people that have provided information, but... I want to get, I'm not, I guess I'm not quite there yet. Let me get to it. But we have other descriptions found in the Talmud, but here's the Madaba map. This is what I was wanting to work toward. Uh, if you look at that, and I don't have a pointer right now, but if you look at that, if you look toward the, to the, to the left, right underneath where it says Madaba map, uh, you'll find out a city that's surrounded and has a colonnade on either side here and another colonnade up here to walk on. That's a pathway. And if you look to the left of that oval, it says the holy city of Jerusalem. And that's what that's saying. And then you have throughout the area, south and north and so forth, uh, you will have the cities that were known at that period of time as being the places that are found in the Bible and where they were. Now you can see the problem though. You got a lot of cities and they're writing much too big. <laughs> and so they're sort of moving past each other. They're not identical. You know, you can't take it and say, well, it's like the Google Maps and you can bring it right in, you know. It's the, but what happens is that as archaeologists have looked in these kinds of places, they say there's a city here of some sort. There's some kind of, there's some kind of a, a location of people living in this area. Uh, and so, and it will accord with the map pretty well. In other words, this is really helpful to archaeologists as they seek to locate places talked about in the Bible. This is the oldest map in the ancient world. And if you notice something's missing, anybody see what is missing there? You might not. To the 
north uh, west portion of that on this map, it looks like, from my angle here. How do I say that? Anyway, up this area, uh, the entire Temple Mount area is not, is not available. It's gone. Now, whether that was intentional or not intentional, it's hard to say. It's, it's old. It took time. People came to this Orthodox Greek church for hundreds of years and walked on this map. And some parts of it are not well preserved. Now, nobody does that today. They've got all sorts of guardian things. A lot of people think that maybe the ancient people should have been more considerate of us today and provided better information and keep the things more carefully protected so that we didn't have such second, third rate kinds of artifacts and maps and such. They really weren't thinking about the future in those regards. <laughs> you know, they didn't keep it around. That's why I'm always amused every time I have a person talk to me about Noah's Ark. If you look where Noah's Ark is located in, in that area, the chances that, that you'd have that much wood that accessible for people that are trying to build homes and houses and such like, they probably didn't think we should preserve this for posterity. And people keep looking for it. And if they find it, I'll be the first to say wonderful. But the chances of it still existing at this juncture in human history with all the people groups that have lived in that area is extremely unlikely because they wouldn't think, let's take a picture and be sure and preserve this or something of the sort. Uh, and that's what happens with a lot of our artifacts. We get some that are not as good as we would prefer. There are others that are well-preserved because of accidents. They have now found underneath the road that goes from the Pool of Siloam toward the bottom of David City on the way up to the Temple Mount, they located, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. I get ahead of myself. It's hard to put these things separate sometimes. But they found a walkway, and I walked much of the way. I just got tired after a while and quit. <laughs> but, uh, but there's a walkway up all the way up to the southern steps of the Jerusalem for the people to go from the Pool of Siloam up to the Temple Mount as far as their worship. That's phenomenal. But what they found recently with Ends of the Vast, I, mean, it's, it's, I think it's just been months, they found a lot of Roman coins underneath the walkway that date to the time of Pontius Pilate. Okay? So that, um, but they weren't thinking about preserving those for us. They just simply happened to be things that people dropped along the way and they got underneath the ground and eventually they were preserved and didn't decay and now they look pretty decent. So that's what we deal with here in archaeology. Uh, there's a lot of things I wish were better. Um, but this right here shows you a pretty good example. Any of you who have been to Jerusalem, if you went to the Damascus Gate and walked through the city, you would have seen these colonnades on the right, not on the left. But you would see them through there, uh, particularly if you go to the Jewish uh, area there and move to the, uh, through the city. These are the ones that were on either side, probably providing cover overneath for people in the sun to not be uh, hurt by the sun. And, uh, and a walkway went from a statue at the very end there of the emperor and on the way to the end. They've now also found this other one on the, on the, uh, on the map of, at Madaba. They've also found now in just the last few years the, the northern, I say I can't say northern, get my bearing, the eastern section looking toward the sea. <laughs> um, of another, of another colonnade. So they have found what is on the map now. Now it hasn't been all uncovered, but they know it's there. Sometimes to uncover things means you need to destroy people's houses, buildings, and such like in a place like this. And a lot of people don't like their houses and buildings torn down for archaeology, even for the sake of it all. So, uh, so a lot of things sometimes have to happen to make that happen. Okay. Uh, let's see. Anything else I want to show you on that? Oh yeah, uh, that's a picture of the uh, the Church of Nativity, uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, right there in the middle. Okay, where it was. All right. Uh, how do you put names on the map? <laughs> well, it, as you can see, it's somewhat difficult to know. Sometimes they're guesses. 
For example, where is, in fact, Cana of Galilee? I haven't got a clue. But there are three possible places that people use and say it's here. And it's doubtful that it's all three separated. Well, we don't know that. Why? It's because it's not a substantial enough a place. What do you need for places to remain to this day and be found and still be usable or whatever? How, what do you need? You need things to be made of stone. <laughs> you know, you've got to have a lot of things connected, but things that are like wood or things that are, uh, are made of, of lesser materials, uh, oftentimes decay, have been dissembled to use for other places. That oftentimes takes place where you'll have something in one place and they'll actually take it apart so they can use the materials to build something else elsewhere. Again, they were not considerate of us in leaving it where it was. But I don't know. I mean, if we ever go back in time, we can talk to them about it. But you can see you have various kinds of places mentioned like in the Bible. You know, Jerusalem you have Bethel, I, uh, some of these places that you, you're familiar with in, in Scripture. Uh, and there are the reference to the Gibeonites in this location. Uh, and you just try your best to figure out where it is. What happens with archaeologists, the best thing you can do for an archaeologist is please show me an inscription. A piece of stone is not as sufficient as having a name connected to somebody or a comment on an inscription connected to something. That's where you gain your best information is when people write. And other times you have something that's not as good to work with. Well, let's say a few things about the Cradle of Civilization. Writing goes back to about 3000 B.C. of some sort. Not, we're not talking about Shakespeare here. We're talking about very limited little scratching sometimes of just words or locations or such. 15th century gets a lot better because you have the alphabet that has begun. Now, uh, I think you've had Doug Petrovich who's spoken here. I don't know if he talked about his book on the development of language or not. Uh, maybe he did, but he, his perspective is that your basic first language is Hebrew. Um, there's no doubt that that form of language that he's talking about did occur in that time. Uh, when I was in my, some of my, my graduate studies, I studied uh, three different languages that are what are called uh, Northwest Semitic, uh, Moabite, Punic, and Phoenician. And we were always taught, and I've not studied this thoroughly like he has, so I don't know, but uh, we were taught Phoenician was the first language that became the structural language for other languages at that point. But when you look at Phoenician, you look at Hebrew, you look at Punic, and you look at Moabite, you have basically the same language structure to them. So then you'd have to figure out which one is in fact first. And Doug has argued uh, that it is in fact Hebrew, formed I believe in Egypt when they were there. I think that's his position. Uh, I have not yet had a chance to read his book, but I'm sure it's fine. So just to bring that out to you, um, the cradle of civilization. So I mentioned this before. Here's where you have the various groups. But what we're having is the fertile crescent. There's a reason why this is a fertile crescent. Can anybody guess why? Water, rain, <laughs> crops. <laughs> you don't have fertile crescents uh, in the desert. That's why you don't basically have the armies of the ancient world like the, this is unusual. When the Muslims came in in, uh, in the 7th seventh, seventh century, I believe it was, 6, 5, 6, 6, uh, maybe in the late 6th, but that period at least, uh, when they came across the desert, Arabia, into their, that was unheard of because you don't take an army across a desert. There's very good reasons not to do that. You tend to lose a lot of army. So what people would repeatedly do is move through this very watered area, places with crops, ways you could feed an army as you move, or whether even if you're traders, the same reason. You go through some area that people would be receiving your trade. The desert's not a good place to use, so they use the fertile crescent. That's why I'm saying this. Okay. So you can look and see how it's laid out. This is laid out in a different way. 
But uh, if you look at, at media over here, uh, that's in the area we're thinking of, uh, the area of Persia, on up in the north as we're moving across to what we think of as Babylon and Assyria, and on down. If you went on up further uh, north uh, uh, west there, you'd run into the land of the Hittites, who had occupied much of that area. I had the opportunity to go to Hattusha, uh, me and myself and my guide, to uh, a place in Hattusha close to Ankara in Turkey to look at the Hittite kingdom, which didn't exist until the 18th century. Or 19th, late 19th century, it didn't exist until then. No, I, I guess I said that wrong, because it did exist. Scholars just said it didn't exist. I'm being facetious, I know it. <laughs> they said, if there was a Hittite kingdom, we would know it. But they didn't. <laughs> and all of a sudden, this kingdom, which was discounted by biblical scholars not conservatives, but by a lot of biblical scholars in the late 19th and early 20th century, they said it didn't exist. They found a place that had thousands of cuneiform tablets and an entire palace area kingdom. Uh, and now nobody argues that anymore. Matter of fact, you can get a PhD in Hittite if you want to now. A place that didn't exist. So I'm always amused when I hear uh, biblical scholars discount the Bible's text because the Bible keeps being found correct and they keep being found wrong. And after a while, you think you give up when you do it that bad that, time, that much. Matter of fact, I've got in mind some time to write a book called Errors of Biblical Critics Make. There are so many. But the biblical text keeps proving true. So uh, that was a wonderful time up there in the snow in the, in the Hittite kingdom. But anyway, moving across, you have the median area, Babylonia, Sumer, and so forth. And, uh, and moving up into Akkad, which is what we think of as Akkadian, and Baghdad and Sumeria, all these places across that area. That's all the, uh, the Fertile Crescent. And the Syrian, that they're calling it Syrian Desert, we sometimes use the Arabian Desert, Syrian Desert, the same thing. Okay, a Mesopotamia, that word is made up of two words, meso, which means in the midst of, and Potamos. You ever heard of a hippopotamus? <laughs> yeah, it refers to a, a water, a place of water where horses are. They call the hippos, hippopotamuses are big river horses. And uh, they really are. So Mesopotamia, the place between the waters. Where are the place between the waters? What waters? See? There's two obvious waters there, the Tigris and Euphrates, which again becomes the, the beginning of much of what we're looking at here. So much of the other was not very uh, livable. So you have the Persian Gulf, which all of you are aware of. There's the Tigris, there's the Euphrates, and thus you have Mesopotamia between the waters, in the midst of the waters. And I'm going to move on. Uh, so this, all, all of this gives you perspective of the, uh, the fact of, of the ancient world. Now, you had different kingdoms that rose to power. Kingdoms like Assyria, Babylonia, later on the Medo-Persian Empire. Then you had who else? Then you had the Greeks after the Persians, and after the Greeks you had the Romans. And then after that, eh, it was over. So... Uh, this is a period, but notice the focus is in this area, not in areas of what we think of as a Western culture. The Western culture only becomes interesting pretty well when you get to the New Testament. But having said that, you need to understand that even in the times of the Old Testament, there were some interactions with things that were beginning to happen. The Western culture and the power and the military, all these things of Greece and Rome were things that were still growing. They wouldn't, really hadn't reached any kind of apex yet. Okay? So the powers that be were really those in the east where you had, again, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and, and the Persians, and the Hittites, and these groups, and always, always Egypt. Sort of funny, Egypt is always sitting down there by themselves almost, occasionally running up and taking countries over, but... There was these dynamics going on. But when Alexander 
came, things changed. And of course, that was precipitated by something earlier when you had the Persian king who came in to take over areas of Greece, and you have the story of the 300. You know that story, right? At Thermopylae, begin to change the whole complex of who could actually win a war or not. And so they say sometimes the history of the world is a history of warfare. And in some respects, that's really true because most of the technology that's been created even till our day comes about through military needs that then become applicable into the setting of the culture. I think that's pretty well substantiable, and that's true at this point. Okay, Fertile Crescent. And I'm going to pass on. I am watching my time. And so what you have is um, different terms used for the land between. We think of the word Israel, but remember Israel is a term that did not begin until the time after Abraham. Okay? It was called, we use the word Levant, the word Canaan, where the Canaanites lived. Then you had Palestine. Palestine really only began when we think about Hadrian, the emperor of Rome, who came and renamed this country of Israel. He renamed it after, in Latin, he named it after the Philistines. It be, the Philistia became Palestine. Philistines became Palestinians. That only began in 8135, not until then. And they were Greeks, not Semitic and Arab, which means Arafat was really bad in his history because he kept arguing that they were, had a long history and they had a right to the land because they were the Philistines, only if they were Greek, which they weren't. So that's another story. Uh, what you have then is three major movements then, up here in the middle and there. Israel became something quite significant because it became the place through which everyone ran back and forth. You were either going through Israel to have a war <laughs> from Egypt up or from there down, or you were going through trading up and down between that. It's a very narrow band coming down that eastern area of the, of the Mediterranean Sea in which God was either allowing people to be influenced by the Israelites or to be conquered by their enemies to pay them a, a little uh, punishment for or, or judgment for what they were doing. They were really in between the problem uh, from time to time. It went one way and one the other way according to His purposes. But uh, the significant they are, I mean, God could have put Abraham a lot of places. And he said, I've got a place that you don't know about. I'm going to take you. And he takes him to this place. Why? Because it's the ideal place for God to do his work among his people. It's not about, it's not about an accident. Geography is totally important here. There's no other place better than this for God to deal with his people. So, Israel's a land bridge, a buffer zone, a testimony. Notice, I have set you in the center of the nations with countries all around, God says. I put you there for a purpose. And you'll find this inside the Davidson Center in Jerusalem, uh, near the uh, walls of uh, the Temple Mount, the center there. This is on the wall. If you'll notice, Jerusalem's in the center of Europe, Asia, and Africa, three continents, Israel's right in the middle. And the Jews happen to say by this that the center of the world is Israel. And the center of Israel is Jerusalem. And the center of Jerusalem is the Temple Mount. And the city of the Temple Mount and the, and the center of the Temple Mount is a temple. The center of the temple is the Holy of Holies. They said this is God's focus. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Well, anyway, it's a, a testimony. I will inflict punishment on you, and I will also give you a chance to give a testimony. Which I wonder if God does that to us. I don't think it's out of hate. I think it's out of discipline for the purpose of good. Sometimes the best lessons you learn don't come through the easiest means. And so God with Israel says, you know, I want to make you a testimony, but in case you're not, I'm going to give you problems. And that will bring you back to maybe giving a testimony. So, 
And so we could move through that, but I, I'm going to sort of stop on that. Now, uh, I just want to say something short about this. This is topographical. And by that, we're looking at things from the side. And if you'll notice that the Dead Sea is the lowest place on the right here, the, the blue. Notice the mountains of Moab and the Judean hills, how they go up. Jerusalem is a city on a hill. By the way, it's not a city on a mountain. But it is a city on a hill. As a matter of fact, it sits on a city of a hill among hills. Right? And so that's what God did. He placed Jerusalem as a city that's high on a hill next to them. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the earthquakes and so forth right now. I just haven't got time. But um, there are all sorts of range, ancient roads that have been identified. There are ways to know, in fact, where people actually tended to walk and travel. Uh, there's a lot of ways to discover that. And uh, some that are very natural. Where would you go if you had a chance to go? So uh, I'm going to move through, through the highways that they've located, including... Uh, you can't see it here. I don't know if I have it here or not. There's a King's Highway, no, that actually goes through Jordan to the right of the, of the Dead Sea there. They call it, we used to sing a song, uh, I can't even, I'm not going to try to sing it for you, but when I was in church as a kid, we had uh, walking on the King's Highway or something like that. It's a highway to heaven, and then you connected all that to the King's Highway, which was not really true. But it, well, we'll come in. it was a great song. Now, uh, <clears throat> There is a lot of things going on here. I'm going to move past them. I want to get to some other things that I think are important for you to know. Uh, I'm going to skip some of this. The regions, there are various regions in the country. Remember, they came to a land of milk and honey. Remember? And that doesn't mean uh, it's going to be easy, 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 and really you can feel yourself. Milk and honey referred to the kinds of the way the country is structured for livestock, uh, livestock and, and growing fields with honey and things of this sort. Honey and, and milk is connected to the kinds of agriculture and so forth that's going on. Uh, you have four basic centers. Uh, you, you have the area that goes right by the plain. That's where largely the so-called Palestinians are today, uh, basically in Gaza, Ashdod, and so forth. Uh, then you have what is called the Shefela, which is an area close to uh, the Negev where you have uh, uh, Zeka, which is on the mountain there, the Valley of Elah where David was with Goliath, some of those places, places like Gezer and such like. And then you have the wilderness of Ju Judah and then finally the Transjordan area. You have all these areas that uh, structurally uh, going up north and south as we're looking at it here. And so you, there's, this is the way it's broken down. Um, this is a map that shows it, but I, I'm not going to take a lot of time with it. Here's something I want to mention. Um, I have a friend. His, his, I don't know if, did you meet Halver Rawning, anybody? The uh, man has a home for Bible translators in Jerusalem. I used to always take my tour groups to his house. He's a very fantastic guy. He used to be a guide for me has lived in Israel, I guess, for 30 years or so, I have 40, and a uh, wonderful man of God. And, but he is trying to train people uh, throughout the world. To, they come to the Home for Bible Translators in Israel where he takes them out on tours and teaches them about the land, the landscape, and the, all the things of topography and geography and language and so forth for them to go back and translate the Hebrew Bible into the language of their people. The reason for that, we say the Bible has been translated to thousands of languages. The problem is the New Testament has been translated into thousands of languages. But the Bible itself largely has not been translated uh, as, the old, as the New Testament has. Now, a lot of people say, who cares? But it is important. Matter of fact, in Islamic lands, if it had been translated years ago and had had any kind of influence, we probably had a, le a, lot, of less, a lot less Islam because there's no answering the questions that the Old Testament answers. Uh, secondly, uh, there's a new book just came out. If you want to get a really good book that, that just came out, I was involved in, uh, not in writing it, but helping it get published, called The Old Testament Really Matters, written by a very fine scholar, 
Dr. Walt Kaiser. If you haven't read his stuff, he's, pre, he's one of the most preeminent scholars in the world. And he said, the Old Testament really matters. And he writes 18 different chapters of the why it matters to read and study the Old Testament. And the, the subtitle of the book, The Old Testament Really Matters, says, A Case for Reading the Bible of Jesus and the Early Church. And it is important. And if you miss it, you miss a lot. So uh, that might be a book you might want to look at, The Case for uh, excuse me, the, uh, the Old Testament really matters by Kaiser. But, Walt, uh, but uh, Howard Running made a point of this. He says, in some countries of the world, when you mention a hill or, or a mountain, you know, their view is maybe a small little thing or maybe Mount Everest or Ararat or someplace like that. Is it a hill or is it a mountain? And how do we turn? If you look at the Hebrew word, oftentimes it can be translated either way. How do you know the difference? You know the geography. Like I dealt with on the Sea of Galilee, is it a lake? The Hebrews call it Lake Kinneret. They don't say Sea of Galilee. <laughs> See, but it's if you look at it, you know what it is. The same thing, if you look at Arafat, would you... And you're translating, would you say that's a high mountain or a hill? Well, it's a mountain. It's a high mountain. It's not just a mountain. But most of the things around Israel are just little bumps. In, certain, in a lot of people's estimation, they're nothing. They're little bitty, little bitty old hills. So how does it work? Did Jesus, was he transfigurated at Mount Tabor as there's a Roman Catholic monastery up there, the place of the transfiguration? Or was it, in fact, Mount Hermon? And there's a lot of reasons to believe it's Mount Hermon because if you read the biblical text, it says one thing. It says, he took them to a high mountain. Let me assure you, Carmel, Tabor, none of those qualify. And you look also in the text, you found out he was in the northern section above Caesarea Philippi that would be close to Hermon. So there's reasons why you would translate things certain ways. That makes sense? To understand the Bible. Arafat and Hermon and Lebanon and all these things, you look and see what is in fact, is Mount of Olives a mountain as we think of a mountain? It's really more like a big hill. The hills that, matter of fact, the text says this, the hills that surround Jerusalem. It doesn't say the mountains. It's the hills. So it's understanding scripture that we're trying to get to here. And this tries to help you do that. Why it matters, it's concerned with the composition of the land, it affects topography, ways you way, talk about the Bible, translate the Bible. All these things are important when you study geography. Now I'm going to take you over here, I'm going to skip ahead because I want to be somewhere within reason and talk to you about uh, here. Uh, this is where I stayed for some time studying along with the monks at the uh, French Dominican uh, monastery and library, second largest in the world, biblical studies and archaeology, next to the Vatican. Great place to be and love the guys. Uh, this, is, this is going on. This is in December. Can you see what's happening? That's snow. If you've not been into Israel in snow time, you haven't been there yet. It is a great place. It started snowing. I went out and took the picture. And then later, it looks like this. <laughs> That's in December in Israel. And uh, maybe you've never seen it that way. And I had not seen it that way. I decided to go over in December in Stafes for a number of weeks. And it was a great experience. Well, um, let me move on down here. The calendars that we found, this was found at Gezer in the area of, uh, uh, to the east, no, excuse me, to the west of Ela. I want to move to a few things here to teach you. Uh, bodies of water, we've done that. Sea of Galilee, you've all you, a lot of you have seen these. I'm just trying to figure out what I want to cover in the rest of the time. Um, Again, this becomes uh, an important area. Uh, 
you saw this, you move west and north, you look here, west this way, north this that way. The travel people took down through Gaza. I'm going to move all these things out of the way. Various peoples that lived around. Uh, here. I'm trying to, I wish I had a way to do this. This thing doesn't work. I normally would be able to use a, a, a cursor, but it won't let me do that. I'm having to sw switch through it. Uh, as you move to places like, like Peter's house and the synagogues, these are locations around this area. Notice this is the Sea of Galilee. It's about 65 miles long. It's, uh, it's not that wide in comparison. It's the shape of a heart. Uh, it's about 100 and I can't think how many page, uh, about 160 something miles down as you go down the River Jordan. But this is, a, is Lake Kinneret, as the Jews call it. Sometimes it's called Gennesaret in the Bible, if you'll notice, but usually it's translated Sea of Galilee. Oh, this is great. Have you been to Jordan, anybody? This is a great site in Jordan. It's one of my favorite. It's uh, the one called uh, Gerasa in the Bible. You have Gadara, Gerasa, and Gergasa. And that becomes a big issue on what, where's the place of, the, of the, the pigs going in the water. And I'm not going to that story too long. But this is one of the three. And this is an ancient uh, city of the Decapolis. There were ten cities. Deca is ten. Polis is city. There were Decapolis, one Decapolis of ten cities that was formed in the days of the Greeks and sustained by the Romans. Only one on the on the uh, western shore of, the, of Israel, and it's called Bet Shean or Scythopolis. And all the other nine are on the other side of the Jordan, and this is one of them called Jerish, a great big site. There's a lot I could talk about. I love Jerish. But uh, here's more like what it would have been looking like in the days of uh, when it was formed there. It's, it's quite a bit of difference. But the colonnades and so forth. I'm uh, going to pass over that. Uh, too much. I've talked about that before. I'm going to pass over it. Uh, see, there's more to be had, but I just can't take the time to do it. You memorizing this as we go? Ah, uh, here, I want to go to this. This is a place <clears throat> that David chews a stone from a brook. And this is the place of Elah. This is taken from a place called Azekah, uh, which is on the uh, big hill, uh, looking down on, on the area of the Elah Valley. And on the other side of there is where the, the place is where David fought Goliath. And that's where the Israelites were. This is where they were looking towards all the Canaanites, uh, not Canaanites, Philistines out that way. And then... A lot of people like to look for rocks. Anybody do this? Okay. And, I, and it says, and he took a smooth stone, right? Five smooth stones. And invariably when people get out there and start picking up stones, they're trying to find stones that look like flying saucers. You know, really smooth and it would whoosh, across the water. That would have been a terrible stone for a, uh, uh, for a slingshot. <laughs> Actually, they're going to look like this. And if you go pick one up there, you need to pick up that kind. These are the ones that fly good. The others would never hit their target. So I say smooth stones, not flat stones. <laughs> so David meets Goliath. I'm going to end up with this uh, issue of Hezekiah's tunnel. One of the problems we've dealt with is how was it that the at the time of Hezekiah, when Sennacherib from Assyria was coming with his army, and this was in the area of 722-21, and he came with his army, he had conquered all the other places, including Lachish, which is the second biggest city, came to Jerusalem, surrounded it, ready to fight it, but before he got there, Hezekiah had an idea, let's really fortify it, to put another big wall in to protect from the northern uh, area. He also, he put a tunnel in to provide water from the... Uh, uh, from the spring that it was uh, here down here at this area right here. And, and so 
we, we've wondered how do these guys without modern technology ever actually come as a, uh, the text that they wrote. They wrote it all in text, the story. He says, we heard the, the sounding of the axes on the other side when they broke through. They were standing there having come right next to each other and broke through the wall without any kind of tool soundings. I mean, you know, it's underground a long ways if you've ever been there. How do you do this? Well, it's been argued now, and I don't know if this is true, but it's been argued that, in fact, they were following the contours of the area there they had located. So instead of doing blind, they actually had a sense of how to do it. I don't know if this is true or not, but that's what we've argued, or what's been argued. This is Hezekiah's tunnel. How many have gone through that? Two of you, okay. Hezekiah's tunnel, great place. Water is nice and warm, comfortable. I hate it. I've stopped going through it. After all these years of sacrifice, I said, let somebody else go. <laughs> and said, it is cold when you go in. I hate cold water. But anyway, here is the city of, of Jerusalem. Uh, excuse me, the city of Jerusalem, Hezekiah's tunnel. Let's see if I can get that to work. Come on. Does this have a thing or not? Oh, there it is. And you can experience it here tonight. <laughs> I, I'm not going to take you through the whole thing this way. But uh, we walked through this. It's not, it, it, at the first portion, looks like it was done by the, uh, the uh, what are they called in Africa, the um, pygmies. And the second portion of it looks like it was done by the Watusis. It's about like this, the, the first portion, the second portion. The people coming from this direction were this tall. <laughs> the person who came from this direction were this tall. And when you get together, you say, how'd this happen this way? I don't know. But anyway, that's, that's the city. And uh, this is the way out that you see as you come toward the end. This is a pool. And we've only found this recently because it was for a long time. When you came out of the Hezekiah's Tunnel, everybody thought this was the Pool of Siloam. And it was called the Pool of Siloam. Now we found out this was a 4th century that Pool of Siloam that was built. And the real one was discovered when a bunch of workers, and I came there the week after this happened, a bunch of workers were working on the water mains there and everything spewed out and they found that they found that they were digging steps. And then the archaeologists come in and they undo the steps and they found a massive uh, area now which also now that leads they found the Pool of Siloam here, and that wasn't the only find. In the excavation, they also found the steps that go up to the Temple Mount. Okay? This pool had not been used since AD 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed. And it was discovered just a few years back, about the week before I came. And then, uh, and then this, now the steps. So it's really wonderful to see these things. Here are the steps. You can see sort of how parts of it are. They can't excavate it all because the other side of it is owned by a monastery that have apple orchard and they do also do not want to open it up to the Jews to dig there because that would say to the Arabs that uh, they are on the side of Israel and so they don't do it because they try to say we don't take sides but anyway we can't uncover it all but these are some drawings this is where in fact the a person who was blind was found in John's gospel remember that story at the Pool of Siloam. Shiloach is actually, in fact, the Hebrew from the Old Testament. Siloam is actually from more Arabic. So what we find, this is sort of a person's rendition that's sort of cool, how it once upon a time it would have been. Been a beautiful place to come for an after afternoon to walk. Okay, well, I didn't cover it quite as fast as I needed to before, but thank you for paying attention. Um, there's a lot to be known, and I try to just share some portions with you. And next time I want to spend some time, when we do this, I want to spend some time talking about archaeology and the uh, early church, what happened in Acts, what happened in the epistles. And the last one I'll do for you is, study archaeology of the seven churches and go into all those kind of questions of, of, of uh, Asia Minor
and what occurred and the various ones. Oh, by the way, just the other day, something I've been praying about and thinking about and arguing about for a long time, uh, because I have a lot of interest, I've done work on this area. I almost did a commentary on it. Uh, I was actually doing the commentary when the publisher who had it canceled the series. <laughs> but, but it wasn't me, which is the series. And, uh, but I've been there many times, and I've been on the top and walked around it. I've stamped my foot. I said, there's stone under here, you know. They have now made a decision, set dates to begin excavating the city of Colossae, to which Paul wrote the book of Colossians, a very important center, uh, the place to which the letter of the Colossians went, and also uh, we find uh, probably uh, Philemon has some contact there and others. It's, it's a pretty exciting kind of thing that they are now starting archaeology at Colossae because when I first, oh, Lord, how many years ago has that been? <laughs> a couple of, 20 years at least. <laughs> uh, when I first went to Laodicea years ago, me and a pastor and his wife on a trip, so showing them the area. Uh, we did a, uh, a cruise on the Mediterranean, or the uh, Aegean Sea, then went to this. We got, we got to Laodicea, and the guy said, well, this is where Laodicea is. And I said, where? <laughs> he said, it's out there. And I got out of the van, and I went over there, and I saw an area like this. That told me immediately this is probably a Greek theater because that's where the Greeks built their theaters at a really nice curved area. The Romans built theirs on stilts and stone. They didn't need any kind of curvature. And so I went over there and I started kicking around and I saw a stone. I thought there was a theater here. Now you go to Laodicea after all these years and it is probably the second best developed uh, city of the entire Asia Minor area. And it's, I mean, it's grandiose right now. It's wonderful how they got it. So I'm hoping that Colossae becomes the same thing. It could be a wonderful site to have and find some more new information. God bless you. Thank you so much for putting up with me and all this speed and talking and so forth. But I hope some of this has been of some value to you. Uh, Sunday morning is going to be real special. I'm real excited about uh, speaking on uh, the first. Uh, I know we're early, but see, the second one is in December. So this is only fair to start at about this period of time to talk about the first Bethlehem story. So uh, we'll do that Sunday morning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for all your blessings to us, the knowledge that you provided through the study of archaeology and history, and that you have uh, helped us, Lord, to understand so much that we would not have understood without your help. And Lord, we just pray that all of our uh, commitment is to know you and to know you in the most perfect way that we can to understand Scripture and understand it through reading and careful study that we might glorify your name and your work in the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.